All right, I got a quiz for you. Think quick. How many doors do you have in your house? Well, put a number in your brain. Okay, now did you count the front door and the back door? Did you count the porch doors? Uh, did you count the bathroom doors? Did you count the bedroom doors? Uh, did you count the shower door? Uh, how about the attic door? You have trap doors anywhere? How about your doggy door? Screen doors, you have them too at the other doors? Cabinet doors, did you put them in? Yeah, you get my point, we have a lot of doors. The word door is used 400 times in your Bible. It's a metaphor. It's an image. Doors represent the important stuff of your life. Sometimes God opens up doors and sometimes God closes doors. But the point is, a door can be an incredibly significant spiritual part of your life. It can be an entrance or it could be an exit. It, it can be a bridge to something great or a barricade. A door can say, welcome, come in. Or a door can say, you're not welcome. Spiritually, a door can represent a lot of things. I don't know if you've ever read this verse, but these are the words of Jesus. I'm the one who's holy and true. And I have the keys that belong to David. When I open a door, no one can close it. When I close the door, no one can open it. Now listen to what I say. I know everything you've done. And I've placed before you an open door that no one can close. You were not very strong, but you obeyed my message. And you did not deny that you are my followers. That's one big door we've already talked about just a little bit now. I look at my life, I have had so many doors opened and I have had so many doors slammed in my face. It's just been absolutely incredible. And we need to talk about that. This is the final sermon in this series that we've been talking about facing our future. We need to talk a little bit about those doors we're gonna have. Seven things I wanna say, but I'm gonna say them fast. Number one, Every door is a decision. A door is obviously a metaphor most of the time. It's a, a, an image for the choice we have to make each day. But understand, your future is the sum total of all the decisions you make starting right now, this moment. And you learned pretty early in life that there were some doors that you shouldn't walk through. There were some doors that you couldn't walk through. And there were a lot of doors that weren't walking through. But every time you see a door, it's a decision. And you just can't put them off. You have to make these decisions. Will I go through it or not? Now, number two. My future will be shaped by the decisions that I make right now. The doors that I walk past and the doors that I choose to enter. Your future is determined by your choices. Today I'm giving you a choice, Moses said. You can choose life and success or death and disaster. Now the tough part is knowing which door to, to choose. Because every time you walk through a door, there's a tremendous uh, expenditure of time, maybe some money, energy, maybe even people in your life. All right, true confession. How many of you have ever walked through the door that you thought was the right door and it ended up being the wrong door? The rest of you are too afraid to answer, uh-huh. I think we all have, and the tough part about that is once you walk through the wrong door, it takes a little while to get back on the right path. There are some doors that if you choose to walk in that door, it's going to take you years to get your life back together. There's no easy way about saying that. 
That's why it's so important for you to have the wisdom to make the right decision up front. And what do you need to help you make the right decision when it comes to the doors, the decisions of life? It's a very biblical word called discernment. We don't, <coughs> we don't talk about it a whole lot. We don't even preach about it a whole lot. But we are today. The more discerning you are, the more wisdom you have developed in life. The wiser you'll be and the better your decisions that you're going to make in life. But now here's the problem, like I've already said, I think. Most of the time you can't see behind what, or you can't see behind the door. You remember Imani Hall? Will it be door number one, door number two, or door number three? And you know how the show went, you might find a brand new car behind the first door and a year's supply of toilet paper behind the second door. Just know that your destiny is going to be shaped by which doors you walk past and which doors you walk through. So number three, a door may be, and I got a couple maybes here, so stay with me. A door may be an opportunity of, from God. I, I've seen them. And when God gives you an opportunity, it's he's going to open up a door. It's just going to literally blow your mind. Here's a good example on the screen. Paul again. A huge door of opportunity for good work has appeared, opened up here. There's also mushrooming opposition. You notice that second part, opposition. There's always some opposition with every opportunity. And just because God opens a door for you doesn't mean you get a free ride through life. There'll be some difficulties, there'll be some opposition, but you'll never have an opportunity from God that's not going to be like that. But a door can also be a distraction, number two, from other people. And it looks like a good opportunity. We jump in it and it ends up being a distraction. And it actually keeps you from doing what God wants you to do. And you walk up through that door, it ends in a dead end, and so you've got to turn right around and try to find the path again. That's why you need discernment. Because not every door is an opportunity from God. Some of them are just plain distractions from other people. Now God has a wonderful plan for your life, but so does everybody else on this planet. And everybody else is going to offer you all sorts of good things, good opportunities that sound so good, but they're all really about how they can use you for their money, energy, and opportunity. And when I see an open door, it doesn't automatically mean it's from God. It doesn't mean automatically that's what I'm supposed to do with my life. I have to be able to discern is it from God or is it just from somebody else? Now, a good example and a, and a good loyal story to, to learn. There's a guy in the Old Testament called Nehemiah. And he was part of the Jewish nation and they were captured by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians just took the people back to their country. And then years later, the, another nation called the nation of Persia came in and conquered the Babylonians, and so they inherited these Israeli slaves. And in this situation, Nehemiah actually works his way up the system to be in the leadership of, of slavery to the king. And uh, he's now the chief servant for King Artaxerxes of Persia. And he's sad because he knows what's happening back in Israel. Jerusalem has been devastated. The walls have been torn down. The people who still stay there, a, a small minority, are, are being robbed and misabused. And so Nehemiah starts praying to God to open a door. He says, God, I really want to rebuild that wall. I want my people and your people to be safe. And he's thinking through a plan. And he prays about it. He fasts about it. And he waits. One day, King Artaxerxes comes in and says, Nehemiah, you look kind of down today. 
You look a little gloomy. Are you depressed? What's going on? And Nehemiah says, King, your honor, sir, I'm just sad because my hometown lies in ruin. And the people are unprotected and they're, they're being threatened and other people are taking advantage of it. Now, anybody else could have just simply blown him off and said, oh, that's just like really too bad there, Nehemiah. But this king, for some reason, we really don't know why. He says, well, what do you want me to do? Boom. That's called an open door. A pagan king who has no interest at all in the God of the Israelites. He is the leader of the largest nation in the world at that time. And he says to a servant, a slave, what would you like? And Nehemiah has been prepared for this. He's ready. He said, well, here's what I'd like you to do. And he just lays it out and he says, I want to go back. I want to rebuild the city. I want to do this. I want to do that. And the king goes, well, how long do you think it's going to take? And he said, well, how much money do you think it'll take? And Nehemiah goes, the point is that Nehemiah had this thing worked out. Which is an important thing to learn here as we go down through this story. What do you do while you're waiting for God to open a door in your life? Well, you plan for it. Now, let me bring that closer home. Just suppose tomorrow someone walks up to you out of the blue and he says, God's leading me to help you. What do you want to do with your life and how can I help you get there? What would you say? <laughs> would, you give, would you be able to give them your plan? Would you be able to even give them a direction that you want to head with your life or, or not? You see, what you don't want to do when you're waiting is to sit around and do nothing. A lot of people think, well, if God doesn't open the door today, I'm just going to sit around, watch TV, and eat Krispy Kremes. That's called laziness. When God is working to get you to all these places, you need to be planning. Anyway, here, back to the story. The king lets Nehemiah go. He goes back. He starts rebuilding the wall. Not everybody is happy to see him, all these people who are taking advantage of his other people. These thieves, robbers, don't want the wall, wall, excuse me, walls rebuilt. And they do everything they can do to discourage this guy. And they criticize him. And they make fun of him. And they threaten to kill him. But Nehemiah just keeps going on. Because see, this guy's focused. And he's even got a strategy. It's a great book. It's not that big. Read it sometime. It's an enjoyable book. And so when they can't get him one way, their plan becomes, let's just delay him. And that's what we're talking about. People often try to delay us. They ask for a meeting, a big powwow, and they want to distract him. And Nehemiah is too smart for that. He says, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm doing an important work right now. Why should a, the work come to a stop while I come down to see you? You know, sometimes in life, we have to do that. Sometimes we have to say, why should I stop doing what I feel is the best, most honorable thing for me to do and go do what you want me to do, which may not be so honorable. And then finally, still in this part here, a door may be a trap from Satan. Jesus once said, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You're looking at things merely from a human viewpoint, not from God's. <clears throat> that one's so important, I gave it another one. So this is now number four. If an open door is truly from God, it is not going to contradict what God has already said in the Bible. If the door tells you to do something beside what's in the Bible, it's not a door from God. Example, guy comes in your office or wherever you're working. 
his marriage is not going so good. But he's talking about how God is opening up a door with his beautiful secretary down in his office. Is that from God? No, because it contradicts God's word. Or he comes in and says, you won't believe what I stumbled into. This is such a great plan. It's an opportunity to make major money. Uh, I get to go here. I get to do that. And he implies that there's also a little shadiness to it, that he may have to do some things just not quite ethical and honest. Is that an open door from God? No, because it contradicts what God's word has said. Jesus said, if heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. If it was a true a thousand years ago, it's true today. If it was wrong a thousand years ago, it is still wrong today. Or else we have a God who changes his mind all the time. Forget what the culture says every once in a while and just remember what God says. Number five, sometimes God shuts a door for my protection. Genesis 7 said, then God shut the door. And that was a little door. He shut the door on the ark to keep Noah and all the people safe. But sometimes it happens in your life. You are so convinced you ought to go that away, and the door just slammed right in your face. Paul and Luke talk about that in the book of Acts, how they wanted to go to various places to minister. But the Spirit said, no, 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 not now, not now. Now, we don't understand why it happens like that, but you have to trust God, I think. Maybe he's trying to protect us and get us right back on the, the right path. Number six, doors open for me when I open doors for others. Solomon says, anyone who generously blesses others will be generously blessed. And when you refresh others, you will be refreshed yourself. There are more promises about money in the Bible than anything else. Not so much money, but generosity. Sure, a lot of it is about money. But it's about being generous in all areas of life. With your praise, your time, your energy, maybe even your home. I mean, there's a great religious word called hospitality. It's one of those key things followers of Jesus are good at. Christians are good at opening doors for other people. And they're good at being generous. You say, well, why? Why, why do I always come back to that word generous? Because God's a generous God. And you were made in God's image, and God wants you to act like he would act. And he simply says, you open doors for other people, he'll open more doors for you. Seven, we're going to hit just very sh uh, slow or short. Sometimes God opens a door just so we can get a glimpse of the future. Don't have time to explain everything here from Habakkuk, but listen to what he's saying. The things I'm planning for you, won't happen right now. But slowly, steadily, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. And if it seems slow, don't despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. I think sometimes God just gives you a glimpse of the future to make sure you're working in the right direction. You don't get to see it all. You don't even get to do it all at this point. Seven things I told you about an open door. Now, why? What's the takeaway? What's the point, as they say? The last slide says this. We need to learn discernment to know which doors to walk through. This is my prayer for you, says Paul, that your love will keep growing more and more with knowledge and greater discernment so that you will be able to make the right choices. We all have dozens of doors. They're just plain old decisions. Discernment is knowing which ones to walk away from and which ones to walk through. Discernment is nothing more than the ability to consistently decide between truth and error and right and wrong. 
It is the process of making a decision based on the truth. In other words, the sermon is learning how to think biblically. And, and you got to get this. If we can't learn discernment, we'll never be able to distinguish between truth and error. And if we can't distinguish between truth and error, that is going to lead us as believers into all sorts of untruths and false teachings. And if we start getting messed up in false teachings and getting our, our ability there all messed up, it naturally leads to unbiblical decisions, stupid decisions, unbiblical behavior, and it ultimately leads to disaster. Now, unfortunately, discernment is not one of the high points of the church in the 21st century. I think we all stumble here. We've kind of lost our ability to measure the world by your word. Now, we can do it the other way. We can let the world measure us by its word, but we've lost the ability or the willingness or the strength. I'm not sure. We've lost the willingness to say, look, no, this is not truth. This is not the words of God. That makes for a weak believer. That makes for a weak church. And so I hope your prayer this week will ask for discernment on a couple occasions. And get your Bibles out. From wherever you've been hiding them, get them out and start reading because how will you know what God says about any subject if you've never read what God has said? All right, let's stand and let's uh, share.